Babylon Squared picks up in late Season 1. Now, season 1 had been a rough one, and one of the problems was gelling the humor of the script to the performance of the actors. A lot of times, the stuff reads as funny, but as it came out of their mouths, it struggles. Ivanova's comment in last week's Midnight on the Firing Line, which was meant to be light-hearted banter, was perceived by a lot of people as uptight bitchiness when she said she was going to bust his uh, hands off at the wrists. It wasn't that the actors weren't good at what they were doing, more or less just that a period was needed to get them and the writers to mesh. So that's why, as Ivanova shows up for breakfast exhausted because of some tachyon readings, those always put me off my sleep, the scene plays nicely as Sinclair and Garibaldi punk her into dozing off at the table and then pretending that she slept through breakfast. When you're trapped on a space station over a barren planet, hey, you gotta make your own fun. Ivanova sent a Star Fury to go check out those tachyons. It's a three-hour trip one way, but when he arrives, he sees something so shocking, the screen whites out and he dies. Must have looked into the Ark of the Covenant. The weird part is that, after the titles, we learn the ship is otherwise fine. In fact, it's returning to B5 as they speak. Star Furies are like salmon. They instinctively return to their spawning grounds. When it gets back, they confirm that the pilot is indeed dead. What was the cause of death? Drowning, naturally. Nope, the answer is even weirder. He died of old age, even though he's 30 years old. Hmm, I think he's come down with Logan's Run Syndrome. He left a message behind, though, scratched into his buckle. B4. Oh, not that stupid android from Nemesis, I hope. Nope, it actually means Babylon 4. As the pilot established, the reason that this is Babylon 5 is because the first three were sabotaged and the fourth one simply vanished without a trace. That was a bit of a problem. They made Babylon 4 the biggest one of them all. It was heavily armed and used leftover parts from the first three to make this big colossal thing and then it just, you know, up and disappeared. Oops. Babylon 5 only got made because it was a less ambitious station and had the financial backing of the Minbari to help, hence why they were able to push for Sinclair to be the station's commander. There was no hint on what could have happened to B4, only now those tachyons are coming from the same place that B4 was before it disappeared. This buckle suggests that the station is somehow back, and you can't argue with a buckle. This is confirmed when they pick up a distress call from Babylon 4, and the signal matches the ID that's on record for B4. It's unique to every command ship and station to make sure that no false orders are given out. And during the brief time when they talk to the desperate guy in charge, the date stamp on the message is four years behind the times. Although it is new, so you know that's nothing unusual. You usually have to set the date on the new appliances. Naturally, Sinclair is going to head over there to help evacuate, for the same reason that when he allows the crews to refuse this mission due to the risk, none of them take him up on that. Who wants to pass up the chance to see the greatest mystery of the last decade possibly be solved, right? While all that's going on, Delenn is busy with the B-plot. She's heading out in a Minbari ship of her own for some mission, and eventually she's picked up by one of their ships. She's here for a meeting of the Grey Council, of which it turns out she is a member. And now, apparently, is the boss, because they've decided to have her take Dukat's place as the leader of the Minbari. She's resistant to the idea, possibly because instead of involving herself in the drama of Babylon 5, she'd be stuck here with this chorus of dull people. Well, while she's dealing with that, Sinclair and Garibaldi are on the long journey to Babylon 4, and naturally, on that trip, you can only imagine the questions that are going to come to mind when faced with an unspeakable event and the answer to a mystery that has fascinated the whole galaxy for years. Okay, it's morning. You're getting ready to go to work. You pull on your pants. You fasten and then zip, the zipper then fasten. It's like Seinfeld in space. Garibaldi points out an issue with Sinclair that has come up a lot. His super seriousness. Can't they just have a conversation that isn't about the end of the world? That's his point. It's a nice one too by JMS, addressing a criticism of the show while turning it into a story positive rather than being a clear reaction to the fans, positively or negatively, that occurs in many similar kinds of cases. If you're curious, both of them fasten and then zip, also known as the correct way to do it. But there it is, Babylon 4, inexplicably there and surrounded by a distortion field of some kind. 
But right now what matters is rescuing the people on board before this thing does another quantum leap or whatever. So they bring in their shuttles and Sinclair and Garibaldi head on board with weapons ready just in case there's something hostile here. And since they're soon getting shot at, I'd say that's a yes. Garibaldi manages to take the guy down with minimal trouble though. Best thing to do in a rescue mission is to try to avoid shooting the people you're there to rescue. Major Lewis, the guy from the distress signal, shows up. He's the overseer of the final stages of construction of Babylon 4, and so pretty much is the guy in charge for the moment. He takes the news pretty well, considering that he just lost four years of his life, but it might be because of the hell that he's been going through. Case in point, Sinclair has a flash and he's on Babylon 5 with Garibaldi as chaos is going down. Somebody's trying to cut their way in and everyone's all panicked. Sinclair has no idea what's going on, but Garibaldi tells him he's rigged up the reactor to overload, so... Whatever it is, it's pretty bad. Blowing up the station you're on isn't really the solution for cockroach infestation. Incidentally, at the end, as Sinclair's dragged off by the crowd and Garibaldi stays for his heroic last stand, he screams things comparable to what Hudson did at his end during Aliens. And this wasn't by design, actually. JMS just put in for Garibaldi to yell while he's blasting things, but there was some problem with doing it as a sustained yell for that length, so Doyle was told to just improvise something and yell it. And JMS wasn't happy with that. He didn't want to have an alien's homage in the middle of this thing, but since we know Garibaldi was already in a 20th century sci-fi thanks to Duck Dodgers, hey, it isn't a stretch to think he was deliberately quoting an old movie that he saw that seemed to fit his mood at the moment. As Major Lewis explains, everyone slips forward or backward in time for a short while whenever these flashes happen, so they need to amscrate toot sweet, if I may use military jargon for a moment. While they're trying to sort that out, Delenn is torn up over the idea of taking over, yet refusal of that is without precedent. But she's certain that her place is on Babylon 5 to serve her part in the prophecy. They will say it is just the voice of ego and of pride. Yeah, nothing is more egotistical than refusing to become the unanimously appointed leader of an interstellar race. While they consider the politics of that, Sinclair is learning more about what happened to B4. 24 hours after going online, that's when the first time discrepancies started. And also, when they found this alien caveman on board, Zathros. Wolverine's ugly cousin reacts to Sinclair with excitement at first, but then is disappointed, saying, Not the one, whatever that means. He says they're doing this because they need this place, the biggest of the Babylon stations, but it's a little fuzzy on the reasons. Zathras tells. You let Zathras go. Finish what Zathras came for. Zathras tells. Maybe we don't break Zathras' scrawny little neck. That's a pretty persuasive argument, I think. Zathra says there is a terrible war which can lead to the end of everything, which is unacceptable because everything makes up 100% of my lifestyle. They follow the one with the phrase, we live for the one, we would die for the one, although that's really occupational hazard when it comes to war. One important question is whether this war is in the past or in the future, but Zathras doesn't seem to know the Earth calendar too well, on the list alongside of math skills and bathing. This conversation is interrupted by the arrival of a figure emerging out of nowhere in a spacesuit. Obviously, the guy's not doing too hot. He's fading in and out, and Zathra says that this is the one. Seems that our translucent friend was trying to stop the station long enough to evacuate it, but at great personal cost. Sinclair heads over to see if maybe he can do something to help. Not sure what, but maybe touching hands will help? Well, no. It actually gives him a temporal haymaker and throws him across the room. And in the confusion, Zathroth gives the one, trademark, some kind of doohickey that helps him to fade away. And Zathroth figures he'll do the same, but the old-fashioned way. Not that he gets very far. Zathroth says he's built for speed as a garbage truck. Well, he's insisting that they leave while they still can. Delenn meets with the Grey Council again, reminding them that the reason they stopped the war was because of Valen's prophecy that they would need some of those amongst the humans to help, and so exterminating them would kind of get in the way of that. She believes she needs to stay and continue observing them, and she gives a humanist speech that Gene Roddenberry would jerk off to in order to explain why she needs to do that. They take a vote and she squeaks by to stay, but they are not happy. 
See if we ever make you supreme leader again. Back on Babylon 4, while the evacuation is still underway, Zathros explains that the thing he handed off was a time stabilizer to prevent the thing that happened to that dead pilot from happening to the one. Same problem for Zathros, given the situation. What if we take you with us? Put you on trial? Zathros not of this time. You take, Zathros die. You leave, Zathros die. Either way, it is bad for Zathros. <laughs> I can't argue with that. They're getting near the end of the evacuation, which is good because the flash arounds are still going on, yanking Garibaldi back to the time that he left his lady on Mars to join Sinclair on Babylon 5. And she decided that she's not interested in living on some space station when she has the glory of Mars to enjoy. And we now return to our panicked evacuation already in progress. Major Lewis is bringing Zathras along. Live or dead, he's proof of what happened here. That and the 1,000 witnesses who can back up his claim, the recording of Babylon 4's distress signal, the autopsy on the dead pilot, the testimony of Babylon 5's commander himself. But besides that, Zathros is the only evidence Lewis has. Zathros's day continues to get better as one of the posts collapse on him while they're trying to leave, and Major Scaredy Cat leaves him to get the hell out of there. Sinclair tries to help, but Zathros insists that Sinclair has a destiny he has to fulfill, and that means leaving Zathros behind. But don't worry, he's fine. The One shows up to rescue him after they're gone. Now, time to channel your inner Scooby-Doo. Let's take off the mask and see who it really is. Yep, couldn't be happy with one Babylon station. No, you just had to have two of them, didn't you, Sinclair? As they are departing, so too is Delenn from the Grey Council although one of them is nice enough to give her one of the triluminaries, the thing that she'll be using in Chrysalis, as a parting gift. The guy even name drops the Signs Importance title for the season, because we've got to remind everybody that we're approaching that end of season climax soon. After the MMA episode, of course. I've got to squeeze that one in there. Babylon Squared is a must-see. These events are vital for understanding a major plot of the Babylon 5 story. GMS does a good job of answering questions while maintaining some mystery related to Babylon 4, avoiding the lost situation where a question is brought up and then dragged out to lengths of frustration. Here, we get an answer to why Babylon 4 vanished, but are left wondering how and why precisely Sinclair and Delenn are going to do this. The biggest weakness of the episode is some of the guest performers, with the Doom Pilot and Major Lewis both having moments that are really cringe-worthy as far as acting goes. But that's heavily contrasted with the character of Zathras, who is done admirably. He could have so easily become the Jar Jar Binks of the episode, but instead his eccentric behavior adds some much-needed comedic moments to the exposition-heavy episode. Delenn's B-plot exists to provide a break from the Babylon 4 plot for purposes of pacing, I believe, and in retrospect it's clear why these events in particular would be the ones that plot would share with this episode, but I must admit to a bit of frustration with them, as they seem to get in the way of us finding out more about the interesting stuff that's happening on B4. It's good to make us want more, definitely, but the consequence is more that we want what Delenn is getting up to less. Which is a shame, because it does have some important information about her, her character, the Great Council, and the first hint of what is coming and why with regards to the Minbari. I think it might have worked better if more of the flash-forward-slash-backwards stuff was used. In particular, it could have been an interesting chance for Sinclair to get a hint at what happened during that missing 24 hours during the Battle of the Line. Not, not an answer, but maybe dropping in the hint that Delenn was there, perhaps. Still, Babylon Squared was overall a successful outing for a season that was struggling in many ways and showed the first real signs that the show was actually coming together into something great. Talk socks? No. Just a question. I'm not having this conversation.